and welcome to another episode of The Drop Kickoff. It is myself, Nathan, hosting this week, as we have some big news that's just broken over the last couple of hours. If you've t- tuned into the Waratah socials, if you've seen across Twitter, you would have seen that Waratah's coach, Darren Coleman, has been has been told that he won't be coaching at the end of the season. He will have he has two more games left, and then they'll move into a new future, heading into 2025. So I'm a Nathan in between two Nicks today, as I got Nick Wasilia, Nick Hartman next to me to chat about essentially what's happened, what should be the next step for the Waratahs. Um, Nick, how are you going? Pretty solid. Good. I think it's a, it's, it's inc- incredibly appropriate for us to only do a breaking news podcast when it concerns the Waratahs. Uh, really trying to, <laughs> to to smash this elite bias podcast vibe, aren't we, man? <laughs> We're in New South Wales Mafia. We have to. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's how it is. <laughs> how it is. Yeah, a bit weird that we're experimenting, Nathan, being the, um, what do you call yourself, the adjudicator before, uh, but um, all based it's weird, on... Eh? So for this for context, this is, the, for context, this is often one of the Nick's roles, you know, I, I'm just there to just uh, throw some pot shot comments out there and just ultimately talk a bit of rubbish, but... To bring, this, bring some when this... of uh, knowledge to the podcast and authority. Yeah, let's go, let's go with that. Um... Basically, it was essentially what has sparked this sort of change and, you know, mix it up a little bit is when the news of Coleman's, um, you don't want to say sack, it's Coleman's sacking, yeah, don't, don't put it in those harsh words, but that's essentially what's happened is he's been let go, is there were two very different camps. There was the, this was a bad call, he should have stayed and we can't lose someone like this, or no, nah, we should have blown this up and we got to start again. So... Let's start there first off, and I will start with the blow it up camp, Nick Hartman. Nick, Wales is a great choice. I wouldn't say um, I'm the blow it up camp, um, although a lot of blowing up does have to happen, whether uh, figuratively or literally. Um, I look uh, the decision itself makes a, a lot of sense. Teammate winning, you get rid of the coach. He's been there for three years. As I, I think we've probably I've discussed on the podcast, I've definitely discussed here and there, definitely on the chat with other people, um, that I think he'd done all he can had could with the team. Um, but I really feel that he's going to leave the Waratahs a shambles, and he found it a shambles. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to say that it's his fault that it is a shambles. I just think, you know, Rob Penny found a shambles after shambles. I can't... Daryl Daryl Maguire? Was that his name? Gibson. Daryl Gibson. 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 I don't know where I got Maguire from. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if he, if he found it a shambles either. Um, I don't think so, no, because Checker left. But, I mean, it's just kind of sad. I, uh, I don't really get into it all, but, I mean, I can't understand why I don't... I don't think it's, but I don't really think it's Coleman's fault. The team's performance is not his fault. To like, I mean, I which I agree with, and we'll echo her thoughts. So, from a drop kickoff perspective, he's one of the, I would argue, the most high profile recurring guests we've had. He's always been great this time with us. He's been great to deal with from a coach to journalist perspective myself. And it's generally one of the sort of better characters around New South Wales rugby, let alone Australian rugby. And like losing someone like that was essentially the argument that um, Nick Wasilev made is that go for him to leave. This is essentially restarting the cycle. Um, Nick, expand on that and why you think this this wasn't the right time to do it. Well, so I think I, I in small clarification for that uh, for that point is as a coach, there is one thing I do agree with Nick on uh, with Nick Hartman on, and as a coach, I think. Uh, in the, particularly over the last two seasons, um, Darren Coleman um, has had a lot of issues exposed at Super Rugby level. It is the highest level he's coached at. I mean, of course, there is the, you know, in comparison before that, he's done, you know, assistant roles before and a lot of uh, work in the Australian rugby system. But he's gone over to MLR um, and done quite well, uh, getting a, getting a championship for his efforts, but. Uh, it's clear that as a coach, I think he has uh, he kind of has run. It, it, it was very much a case that he's, he's run his course, and I don't know what else he could have done to improve it, even before you get to all the injuries, um, which I do think part, do lie with him, given he assembled that squad. But uh, you cannot have when you have run out of professional 
actual players in the front row. That's just that's just horrific luck, horrifically bad luck. However, having said that, uh, to remove him from the organization entirely, for them to part ways entirely, I am not okay with, because. Uh, for all of his uh, failings at the Waratahs, I think he is still a very good coach. I also think he's, as we've alluded to, both personally and also just in general, he seems like a very approachable guy. A lot of the team has been very supportive of him. And as well, he is extremely well regarded within New South Wales rugby circles, shoot shield or otherwise. Um, And he can bring players to him. I think he, in my head, I thought the natural progression for him was to be out of that coaching role and into a either general performance or player management role. For him to actually go and depart entirely, clean cut, uh, is effectively we're going back to square one here, which feels exactly the same as what happened when Gibson departed and Penny started. I think we're just going to see more, several more years of underperforming Waratahs if we don't at least keep, if, if, if he is gone completely. Nick, Nick, why is he wrong? Carmen, this is your chance to respond. <laughs> Come on, get the beef out. Let's go. Um, I, I don't really know how to put it in words, but generally you, you don't keep the old boss around. I, it's just a... Uh, the dude was running the drone. There's a certain, I don't know, I feel kind of patronizing here, but there's a certain narcissism and egotism that comes with running any organization. So if you keep the old dude around, he'll start meddling. And then also the, the new person has to be able to breathe and implement their vision. Um, to Nick's point about keeping around, I mean, keeping him around, well, keeping him around doesn't have to necessarily be within New South Wales. You could keep him in the Australian system similar to Nathan Gray, who um, I think after the Wallabies, uh, he probably left for a bit, probably uh, was done, but he's, he's now coaching the under-20s. Am I correct, Nathan? So he's still in the system. Um, so I don't really get keeping him on. Um, as I've said before, I think it's probably his next step is to go to Europe or Japan to a league that doesn't have the crushing pressure of Super Rugby, but is more competitive than MLR or Shoot Shield. I wouldn't even know where MLR's level is. Um, and I just, uh, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. Like, they're pressing square one. And also, sorry, to Nick's point as well, you're saying he's leaving, but it's not like everyone there is leaving. If you're talking about continuity in the Waratahs, Darren Coleman isn't the only one there. So, you know, I I guess, Nathan, you could tell us more, but... Um, uh, Jason Gilmore, is that his name? His assistant yep. coach. So there's chat that he might be leaving. Um, but, I mean, I guess in an interpretation of Nick's, what Nick was saying, are they going to press the reset button? I mean, we truly don't know. Nathan, you would know if they are doing an entire clean out or not. There is no indication that they are. It's To me, they're just kind of... Um, not renewing the contract of a coach that hasn't been very successful in terms of winning games. I mean, the joy of recording this at the time we are, you know, less than three hours after this appointment was made is we don't know what's happening with the assistant coaches yet. We don't have that sort of luxury of hindsight, but there is links that Gilmore will go to England as sort of Nick alluded to. Don't know about Chris Whitaker or um, Paulie Tanwapia, who's his other sort of main core of assistants there, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, in terms of a reset button, I mean, there's a lot of players that are going this year. This It almost feels like the Suali'i era coming in, but what's stopping that? Essentially, the Jake Gordon move would have probably been that reset, in my opinion, but him being blocked sort of indicates that they want to keep a little bit of that IP on board and maybe just sort of not really sort of rebuild, but just reload for the future. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, I don't know. Sorry, you're the host, Nathan. Um, you never like guests interrupting your flow. Um, so let me know if you want to talk about this now. But I mean, that general Just... renewal is, it is concerning. Like 100% it's concerning. You just clear out the stables, have no idea. Like the fact that they're talking about what coach they're going to get, they should know. 
they've been thinking about this the whole year. And, I mean, DC hasn't been treated well, saying, oh, we might sack you after March. And then they, Christy Dorrit on a, on a competitive website who employs one of our contributors, whose name won't be known, the websites, I mean, um, he had a great article about what's going on in the Waratahs, and it just seems like a mess. They said, oh, March, we're going to talk about you. And then March came along and he beat the Crusaders. This is before the Crusaders were, uh, um, you know, crab juice. <laughs> and then I went, okay. And then uh, maybe not, we won't sack you. And then RA, but didn't say it either way. And then RA came in and then said, we're going to review your review. It just feels like, uh, you know, the federal government and uh, PwC at the moment. But um... And, yeah, on that point, I think even the the Paul, uh, Dawn the CEO of the of the Waratahs has actually said he wants to do another review and it feels completely redundant at this point because they've already done a review into the World Cup they've already done a re review into DC they've already done a review of that review like mm. why spend more money on another review and kind of a lot of the going back to this key argument that we're having here uh, of the two camps we saw on um, that whole press release concerns me uh, for a lot of those points that you allude to quite rightly, Nick, because searching for a coach, searching for any sort of stuff, it's effectively a reset. And as Nathan also alluded to, so many players are leaving. I am terrified that we're going to have a repeat of the Rob Penny era in that so many players departed and you're going to have a situation where there's going to be so much young blood that is going to be baptised by fire. And we already know how that is going to turn out because you only have to look at how the Waratahs' front row has gone this season. You get a good couple of rounds out of them and then they're done, done for the rest of the year because the step up from shoot shield is too hard. On at a point that Nick alluded to a little earlier, which is in regards to, you know, DC staying on, but then, you know, bringing someone else in and it might be some tinkering. I mean. I think in most cases and in most business cases, you've got a good point. It's a valid point. But I know, I mean, I think from what I get from DC, he's someone who cares very passionately about New South Wales rugby and he's someone who wants to be an ambassador for it and try and help it in any way, shape and form that he can. And at least he expresses that very openly and honestly publicly. Um, and there is a great comparison that I think we could go down and that is the story of Tanu Munga as a coach. Um, for many years, he was terrible. I'm not going to mince words with you. He was terrible. I mean, you have to look at his record at Toulon. Uh, you have to look at his um, record at places like uh, Gautis Manukau, where he did have some success, but obviously it's a lower level. Um, of course, the most famous one is the Blues, where he was easily in a time where the New Zealand teams were cleaning up. The Blues were by far and away the worst side. But straight after he left the Blues coaching role uh, and Liam McDonald took over, he became the defence coach. He dropped down to the defence coach and he recognised, OK, I'm not at the standard that I need to be at. And New Zealand rugby basically said to him, we want you to stay, stick around. We want you to improve. Um, even though... He is, and I think he genuinely has in that time under McDonald. And even though, you know, Moana Pacifica have, aren't necessarily setting the world on fire, it's easy to forget that he literally had to build an entire squad from scratch. And I would argue that, and, and already Moana Pacifica are having their best season so far off the back of literally the coaching is the key thing that's keeping them there. It goes back to a, a similar article also written by Mr. Doran from, an, from a website that we won't talk about. But it was an article earlier this year where he spoke to a, a number of key ex-Wallaby coaches, of key super rugby coaches, of key ex-Wallaby coaches who had all felt they had been scattered to the wind and abandoned by the governing body. And I feel like if we say, oh, yeah, DC just goes off to Europe, it's another one. It's another one. And I think if you're going to do that and just pick a new coach to begin with, I think we're going to, it's just going to be the same thing again. It's going to be the same thing again. Jeez, I we're the Christy Doran fan show, aren't we? Jesus Christ. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, no, we're just alluding to two particular articles that he's um, I, uh, I think um, uh, you're conflating separate issues. So the Tana Umanga example is basically he wasn't doing very well, but they kept him on. Um, well, that still hasn't been proven. You said Moana Pacifica's best year yet. And it's like, well, 
you know, they, they could only go up. Um, I think they only beat the Waratahs last year in the last game of the season. So yeah, but they still could get they, they still could get the spoon as well. They yes, yeah. that is true. So it's like okay, is that an equivalent? The idea of uh, probably what you're talking to more is recognizing talent and talent pathways is something that I mean can be reflected in the fact that they still don't know they don't have a coach, and they still say that. A well-run organization would be like, okay, he's going, but we've got this guy in fairly quickly. And Australian rugby doesn't really do that. Um, and it's not just coaching, it's talent. You know, Mac Hansen goes to Ireland, tears it up. When he's playing for the Brumbies, who was he? You know? Um, and that is the general Australian rugby issue. I mean, where's Ewan McKenzie gone? He got burnt so bad, he just, I think, last I heard he was working in the construction industry. Um, yeah, what's his name? Uh, the old Fiji coach we might, we'll get into. Uh, Nathan, you can help me. Raul Louis. Raul Louis. Louis. I mean, yeah, Checker uh, pulled him out of his ass. Check his ass. Um, and he was uh, the team manager at Sard Francais or something, and that's how Checker knew him. Brought him in to be a scrum coach. Who's this dude? No one knew who he was, and then he went to Fiji and look how Fiji played. So I think it's just a general issue Australia has, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say just because of Tana Umanga keep him in there. But well, no. Look, obviously Tana Umanga is one example, um, but it's the approach that they've actually chosen to take with the coaches that is the key point that I'm kind of pointing out here, is that there was a recognition of the fact that he was clearly not good enough to coach at Super Rugby Pacific level at that point in time. But that's not to say that he can't be at some point in the future as he grows, as he develops. And the two approaches you can take is you can either say to this coach, go away and find some sort of way to improve, um, which is kind of what has been the status quo at the moment. Or if you're actually someone who's been in the organisation for a long period of time, I mean, DC, even before he was head coach, he was a back in the 90s, he was also an assistant coach at the Waratahs. He's been in the shoot shield for a hell of a long time. He was in the NRC. And but that was a, back a in the 90s. Time. That was what I'm saying is, is that y- yes, but what I'm saying is, is that he's been so involved in New South Wales rugby for an extended period of time. It's his skill set specifically that I think can be a key part of the solution to get the Waratahs out of this endless cycle that they're in. He doesn't necessarily have to be the coach, and I think we can get to that point a little bit later. And I think the point that. Uh, is that I think as a coach, I think at the end of the season, it is kind of proven that whatever tactics and plans he had in place, it didn't work. And as a result, I think coming to the end of his contract, it makes sense. But to cut him off entirely from the organisation and basically have him scatch the wind, it they feels the same. That, but we don't know that they have. They've said in the in the press statement that we wish, we wish Darren Coleman all the best, which basically essentially they- that to me sounds like he's gone. Nathan, that's, Nathan is the that's, that's that basically that's that's I would say yes. That is if you have to sort of read into a statement, and again, um Darren and um Paul Dorm will face the media tomorrow. I would lean towards him being um not involved in New South Wales Rotary's organization in any capacity next year. Yeah, but that sort of doesn't mean he like he can't come back. It of doesn't mean they'll change their mind. Like I said, oh, they've, oh. they haven't even got a guy lined up to replace him. A woman. That's right, but um, but then here's the question: Does he just inherit another? Does he just inherit another when he comes? If and when he comes back, does he just inherit another well, shambles? It's, it's kind uh, of different. It's, what you're saying is about the his talent, which I don't think is unique. I mean, to me, you could pull out any of the shoot shield coaches, and you could say the same stuff about them. Stephen Hoyles, you could say the same thing. Um, Oh, forgive me, um, but uh, who's the, who's the dude he used to coach Randwick or still does and he's on stand? That, that is Stephen Hurls. No, oh, no, no. About Morgan Turinui. Morgan Turinui. You could say the same thing about Morgan Turinui, you know? Um, there's lots of people like that. It's a state of seven and a half million people. Like, there's enough people in it. I just don't think it's a, a huge loss. Yes, I agree with you. I They kind of go, okay. And, and I've said this from the start. You go, okay, uh, Darren, you haven't done so well here, but we'll hook you up, go to Europe, spend time with uh, 
Andy Friend, if Andy Friend's still coaching Connacht. He's, not, he's back here in, so in Canberra. Stuff. Well, you know, he's, he's, just yeah, go out. And I think I think Rugby Australia should do that. You know, if I was in, in so, uh, uh, more concert, in a more concerted effort, they go, okay, you haven't cut it here. We've given you your chance. Go to Europe. And what I think they should do, if I and I don't know if you know how feasible this is, but you know, have a team, a couple of teams in Japan, a couple of teams in Europe, where they have that connection, where they have those contacts, and they can have that pipeline. As I'm sure so, Nathan, you know, yeah, many of the players. Say, so over essentially, in Europe, essentially, you're saying that. Different. Sorry, essentially you're saying you're essentially advocating for the Stephen Larkin route. Mm. Does his time in Australia, goes over to Ireland and comes back. Well, Nick Vasiliev is arguing the um, well, Tim Sampson is probably the best example. A head coach at a super team, has gone, stayed in the system, playing his, his roles in the system perfectly with the Rebels and is turning their season around. It's two yeah. different well, ways I of mean, approaching how to, how to approach DC. Yeah, well, DC could also go to the Force or something, or the, the Reds. I think like, you would Chris... have to be you would have to be selective with it as well. I think because like for example, I wouldn't go. I would be picking someone like Tua Nui or Stephen Halls uh, in terms of that specific example, just because. I mean, most of their experiences at Shoot Shield, whereas unlike that, DC has kind of gone overseas and done some other stuff, which like you do need a baseline of experience. I mean, your your points are actually you know they're good. It's a good idea, but all of that setting up of infrastructure that sounds like a lot of setting up of infrastructure and stuff that. Uh, considering how the how New South Wales rugby and the whole thing is undergoing right now, I mean, of course, we don't know at this current point, but uh, it sounds to me like if they're all, if they're saying we're going to commence the search for a coach, uh, and they haven't got any clear indications about which direction they want to go, I mean, are they looking forward with that sort of foresight? Realistically, all right. Let's just on that wording there. This idea that they're starting to commence in the same way that Australia or the Wallabies were looking for their commence and all of a sudden had Peter Horn lined up as a director of rugby, David Nusifora, and then did the process and landed on Joe Schmidt. Like these could just be words. They could have their ideas in place, which sort of opens us up to this next point of, all right, we've seen it work for the Queensland Reds in terms of they brought in Les Kiss. He's turned it around. Who do you think that guy is for the New South Wales Waratahs? Um, I can see, uh, for those listening on, Nick Hartman's description is please no checker. He's seen as the favourite for the role alongside. <laughs> it's, it's great. I, lo- I love the passion. Which is, uh, he's the favourite alongside guys we mentioned before, like Nathan Gray, Stephen Hoyles, who is, you know, a couple of hours before the announcement has indicated he will stand down from the at the end of the season. Nick, Nick was left. I'll start with you. As a Brumbies fan. If you if say we get to August and September, the name gets announced. This is the coach to take on the Waratahs. Who would you look at? Just from, put your Brumby hat on and say, "Oh Jesus, this is this is a worry for the Brumby standing as the top team. That he could actually turn it around for him." Well, there's two ways you can go about it, which is uh, either a clean out of and bring someone in from overseas, uh, an experienced head from overseas, or you work on. Uh, you know, you work on a particular talent that you have um, and try and actually build a structure and set program in place rather than tearing it all up and starting again. Um, I think the decision, case in point, um, I think the Waratahs really missed a decision to not have Simon Cron take over as coach back after when, when he was a, an assistant coach to Daryl Gibson. And I think the reason he wasn't selected in that uh, regard was probably a contributing factor as to why he went overseas though whether he would have gone well or not is up to is up for debate because i mean that would have been his first stint as a super rugby coach and as we've already seen with dc the step up from nrc and, and shoot shield level is very different to to the likes of super rugby pacific uh so the two options that i would be immediately thinking of is one first name that is immediately comes to my head is if you're going to stay in-house um, Chris Whitaker, I don't think has has he has been an assistant coach before, kind of taking in the role from from Rob Penny. And I, as talented as he is, also the um, Polly uh, Tamo Pia. Uh, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I don't. I think they still need more time in the saddle as assistant coaches. Whereas sorry, Jason sorry, Gilmore, Na- sorry, Nathan's question was: Is your Brumbies hat on? Who would scare you? And you've listed two assistant coaches. So, I don't know if you're no, trying no, to make fun. I'm, I'm, he's, he's building anticipation. He's building anticipation. I'm, I'm building anticipation. This is the long game. I'm doing it the brown like way. We like build just, anticipation. You yeah, we're not. Edgy. Yeah, we're building anticipation. <laughs> uh, Jason Gilmore, I think, has a bit more 
to him because he's had a bit more success, even though it is at, at, at lower levels, uh, you know, the lower division uh, styles of rugby. Uh, but he has had success and uh, generated results and turned things around. Uh, also, he would, have, he would have pre-existing relationship with a lot of that younger talent coming through. Um, he would be my in-house option, and I would be seriously considering him, especially if there's rumours of him going overseas, uh, seriously suggesting that he reconsider that option as a potential uh, direction forward, um, as long as he is also well supported by uh, assistant coaches with significant international experience to help him out. Because I think a key reason why Kevin Foote has done okay at the at the um, or indeed uh, Simon Cron with you know with at least a force at home <laughs> winning the last like eighty percent of their games at home or, um, is because they have he's been pulling experience from a lot of places or people all around the world. Outside of that, uh, I mean the other option he's been back in Australia for a while and we we just mentioned him was Andy Friend. Now Andy Friend. Uh, has has been out of Super Rugby for a little while, uh, and his his record at Super Rugby in previous years was mixed. However, his experience over in Ireland, I reckon, has made, would have made a huge amount of difference, particularly uh, judging on how Les Kiss went uh, and how Les Kiss grew and developed as a coach. And his he also has grown and developed as a coach over in Ireland and is a lot better for it. So I would also be having a chat to Andy because I know Andy has shown explicit interest uh, when the Wallaby discussion was happening. He ex showed explicit interest in coming back and helping Australian rugby. I think those would be the two places to start. I mean, just on, on Andy Friend, he is in Australia. I think he was serving as Scott Favors technical advisor for the Super Rugby Women's Campaign. So already has some sort of blood in the game back here in Australia after that Ireland campaign. Um, Nick Hartman, who do you go with? And why is it not Michael Chaka? <laughs> um, to answer your second question first, um, look, Chek is a great coach. He he definitely gets results. With, with to go back to what Nick and I just discussed in terms of forward planning, building a system. He is not the best coach for that. He is an, an amazing short term burst kind of coach. Um, I mean, compare the Wallabies when he took over to to four years later. I never thought he should have stayed on. Of course, he thinks he should have stayed on. You know, I would if I was him. But he's great at that short burst, a little lemon squeeze. You know, you can squeeze a lemon only so much. Um, I still think, I still think back to when he took charge of the team and he was playing guys like Stephen Hoyles and Mitch Chapman. Um, from memory and you know not to have a go at either those guys but they were quite senior I remember Mitch Chapman was actually going white his hair was going white um, which made it seem even worse but that's what Czech is all about he's always about experience he's not great at bringing through youth now maybe that's got so something to do with super rugby and it's sub test kind of level as opposed to that 30 game a season European kind of style where you do have to have a squad and rotate them through but he went, and then there was the World Cup, and then Foley went, or uh, uh, Phipps went, and then there was this huge hole. So again, talk to 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 Nick about uh, what Nick was talking about about doing a clean slate. It was almost like a clean slate, and then uh, uh, Daryl Gibson took over, and then that's when Jake Gordon came through. And that's the thing that kind of annoys me about Super Rugby that you don't really have that rotation. You don't give those guys minutes, or you have someone like Max Jorgensen. And even too many minutes, and he injures himself. Like anyone could have seen that coming. I was playing way too much footy, so I don't think Checker is the right person. Maybe, maybe kind of like Rod McQueen when he coached the Rebels for one or two years, kind of came out of retirement for that. Maybe one year, but I, he's the, the Waratahs need a system guy. They need to focus on the system. So clearly, this culture of refinement is the new way to go. If you're not sure about the culture of refinement, um, it's just the basic term for talking about how do you get teams to, to, to win and systems and data and all that stuff. There's great little graphs of uh, shots in basketball where they took them from. And now it used to be all over the place, but now it's all around the three-pointer uh, three line and uh, close shots to the net to get two points. And I just don't think like Checker is that kind of figure of the past. Um so that's why I say I wouldn't go checker. 
Um, just can I ask it just a yeah. devil's advocate question here for a sec? Um, like, because yeah. I mean, I'm in agreement with you. I think you know, checker is probably not the right direction for this particular players right now. But I think he would have probably he ha it does seem to have learned a little bit from his Waratahs and Wallaby days. I think uh, the key thing was unlike previously where they're. I mean, I know G Gibson was kind of the successor for that, but obviously that didn't turn out so well. But uh, we're still to see it play out. But I know that Filippo Contiponi at Los Pumas was picked as his successor, and that had always been the strategy. He was meant to always only be the Los Pumas coach for, you know. 18 months and then he 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 decided look i'm going to stick to the original plan Felipe contaponi will become the lost pumas coach and uh i'll and that will be the end of my time maybe just as a is there any way in any way shape or form that maybe that could be potentially beneficial you get that 18 months that you need from him um two seasons and while you have someone like a gilmore in the background as an example to uh, to grow and get ready for that sort of level. And then you actually have, okay, look, maybe you might have one or two seasons of growth and potential there, but you might, it might lead to something a little bit more, maybe uh, an adrenaline shot and, and an espresso shot and ex a checker espresso mm. shot is what they need. Um, I don't know. Maybe it might also pan out to be worse. I, th I think it would only work if it was kind of to give the administrators more time to set up a better system um, and, and Peter Horn. Um, but in terms of the people who you look to, um, talking to Nick about, again, going back to Nick's point about keeping people in the system, maybe Andy Friend is the person to take over. Um, and maybe it's Simon Rawalui. You know, he's a good op. Uh, a good option but you know if i was him i kind of feel going from fiji to the waratahs is uh he doesn't have to do that you know just wait until side front say whatever or one of his coach um earn more money and probably have a better team but um yeah i mean i, ca I can't really say why i mean maybe simon cron is the, the option um wouldn't that be the swerve well cron is definitely in until 20 yeah well, maybe the get Tim in until twenty twenty six. Don't get Tim Sampson in. Um, Tim, Tim but, Sampson, not bad shout. Um, but really, that I, is also I, to consider. I mean, like for all we, yeah. Like I said, that, like that is I something said, to consider that maybe. Maybe what? Come on, Nick. Sorry, spit it out. Sorry. Well, I mean, sorry. I know we've got, we've got the the echo back and forth, but on that point, I mean, seeing as there is a whole bunch of situations going down in Melbourne, and I mean. Realistically speaking, those two teams are are under the RA umbrella. Um, you'd have to assume that maybe they they would be considering an option for the entire coaching staff of the Melbourne Rebels to make their way up to to New South Wales. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you get um Brad Thorne in. Um, but yeah, look, I no one really kind of sings out to me, and um, I'm I'm very wary of the silver bullet. I just I I just don't. Uh, you talk about all the issues at the Waratahs. I don't see how Checker is his solution, other than he's a really good coach and he's not doing anything. Um, That's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it just boggles my mind because it's not the solution the Waratahs need. Because he basically he was coaching last time there any good? Maybe Darren um, Darren Daryl Gibson's uh, first season. Were yeah, they not good? Said. Hey. I think they made semis, or I think I think they got beat by a South African team then from memory. Yeah, and I, you know, they've made quarters come here and there in other seasons, but it's kind of like all you because uh, two thirds of your games are against Australian teams, Which and they play the Hurricanes of... and they get done. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna say a couple of further options that we can throw out there, and which again. All good options, um, but a couple before we get into sort of a, a broader question around this, because, again, we've talked about coaches, but we've identified there is a bigger problem here at play. Um, one which I don't think is mentioned enough um, is jo potential John Menenti, you know, would potentially, you know, at the Olympics this year, could potentially finish up with Seven's program. I'm not sure what his contract is, to be honest, but that's a very – still in the RA umbrella, has had experience at the sort of shoot shield level as well. Um, he he and, went eastward to sevens, right? He went to sevens, so. and, and then him and Tim Walsh swapped. Correct. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, a couple of other sort of points as well. A couple. Of, I'll throw some. These are, the, are names that you won't hear probably from anyone else, but ones that are just long shots that I think have really good futures in the game. Um, Daniel Halengahu, Blues assistant, played Bentley World House before. Um, has been going great guns there. And in a similar vein, Peter Hewitt, been catching in the Black Rams at, at Tur- um, Tokyo. Essentially, been done his time as an assistant, come over to Japan. Another one, if you want to go shoot shield route, um, Zach Beer at North does a great job there. I might not have got the premiership there, but they are consistently top three, top four. So what we figured out is there's a lot of options that we have in terms of from a Waratah's perspective, but that's not going to be the, the sort of the savior. That's not going to be a solution to their problem. So to sort of round this all off, I'll throw I'll throw to Nick Hartman first here. If you're in charge and if you were looking to turn around the Waratahs, and because we know it's just not going to be a head coach, what has to change? Uh, damn, that is a tough question. What does have to change? I think. Oh my god! And you can't I... say just bring Kalaglati back. Yeah, <laughs> damn. Um, I think almost everything has to change. I think we've been talking a lot before about. Oh, you know, the Waratahs, you know, Darren Coleman's doing all right. I think I was talking to you, Nathan, and you were like, just look at the squad, which is crazy to me, but I completely forgot how good that squad is, like just on talent alone. Um, And how it just, uh, how they're not at the level of the big Kiwi sides year after year um, just boggles my mind, but. I just everything, but uh, so maybe <laughs> everything. So that's so great. Like the recruitment has to change. The coaching has to change. I've heard from a couple of people that the culture there is disgusting. People actively do not want to play for the Waratahs because they don't want to participate in that culture. If you look at something like the Brumbies, which you could almost say is a reflex to what's happening at the Waratahs ever since they've started, they actually want to play rugby. They have a good system in place. Um, and I'm not really sure about the talent coming out of ACT. There's one or two, maybe I think is, is Noah a Canberra boy. I'm not really sure. Nick, you can fill me on that later. Brumby's boy. Not Brumby's boy, Brisbane boy. He's a Brisbane boy, but like, there is is a lot more coming out of Canberra. Yeah. Anyway, but it's just maybe, maybe Nathan, to answer your question, what has to change is there needs to be a team in Parramatta. And I know you're laughing no. at this, and I know it is my common thing, but and I'm talking, no, 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 I am deadly serious. I'm deadly serious about this. I honestly, um, I think what has to change is that the people who run the Waratahs have to be humbled by people very close to them. I, I think that. It's what has to change. I mean, you look at the Waratahs perform poorly, shoot shield kind of goes up in standing. Because it's something in the Australian psyche, you can't you can't handle losing, you just go to something that doesn't matter. Well, not doesn't matter, but doesn't matter in I mean in terms of it shouldn't you be know, the same it's way. not it's yeah, it's like Warringa losing to Randwick, who cares? Losing to New Zealand, that's embarrassing in the Australian psyche. Hmm. Um so that's what I kind of think needs to happen um, for the Waratahs to ever get good. Because you look over the, the history of it, it's not good. Um, and it's the same with the Reds. Not good. I don't know. I'm not from Brisbane. I'm not sure what's going on with the Reds. But I just don't know why the Waratahs can't do what the Brumbies have been doing. And the Brumbies have been doing it forever. And look, I don't think Stephen Larkham is an amazing coach, to be honest. But the Brumby system is just diamond after diamond. Picking up players that the Waratahs can't, turning them, making them so much better. Um, I can't remember the, 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 the his name again. This is probably the third time it's happened in this pod. I've forgotten someone's name. But that guy who was playing for Norths and Simon Cron brought him over to the Waratahs, who wasn't a centre. And then he left the Waratahs, didn't play really well, and then went to the Brumbies and just carved. The center, I'm not getting center flanker. Will Miller, Will Miller went from North's, came down basically starting the grand final. But if you're looking for a more modern option, um, Charlie Cow is a great example, an Eastwood yeah, well, back rower. 
goes yeah. down in a contract. Well, it's, okay. so this Nick, kind of leads on. Yeah, Nick, but, sort of, but, you, you can't. You can I throw it in like Nick because you're looking to sort of. I think you go down a similar route that I'm going to challenge you. You can't mention the NPC here. Not NPC, and I say, <laughs> Jesus, I'm feel. I'm getting Kiwi with this here. Okay, yeah, so no, you're, we've already got Nick no. mentioned the Western Sydney chefs. You can't go down that route. How do you fix it? No, I mean, look, you know that the answer that is in there um, because uh, it is true. So add to that point. And it's a great point that has kind of been brought home to me by a couple of conversations with Laurie Fisher, example, about the Brumbies on that point. They look at a player and they have a very set way about how they are going to play. If you look at the Brumbies, you know what they're going to do. And simply, if you are the opposition, your job is to try and be better at what the Brumbies do to win that game. Um, and you have to be very good at that. Uh, if you are, you know, and which is why, and and, and very few sides, most notably the best uh, New Zealand sides are the sides that can do it. They take a player and they say, we want you to play like this to fit into our style that already pre-exists. Um, and a player can do that, and which is why I think we see so many of those players flourish. They pick the players based on those skill sets that they naturally have and bring it to the actual system they have. The Waratahs, even, not just the Waratahs, but I think any side, um, other side, maybe the Queensland Reds are really are starting to change that under you know under the physicality that Thorne has brought and now Kiss is complementing. I think is changing. I think the, there is a bit of a difference between the Reds and the Waratahs. I think I mean the Reds, uh, if you go back his, historically, have a fantastic record uh, even pre professional era. I mean they cleaned up when it was uh, you know the Super Ten and all of that and. Uh, I think they've had a lot more. Uh, they ha still have had a pretty decent record, even though they haven't w only won the same amount of actual uh, professional championships as, uh, you know, only one as the Waratahs. I think, you know, historically, if you look back, the actual alignment with the, a lot of those programs, you know, all under the QIU banner has had a positive impact. And you can see that in how quickly they've been able to turn, how much they've turned things around. They actually came up with a structure and came up with a plan with Thorn and have now executed it, uh, are starting to execute that with a, a head like Kiss coming in. That is seven or eight years of planning. That is seven or eight years of growth. That is seven or eight years of management. Uh, going back to Sydney, um, adds, adding on Nick's point, change everything? Absolutely. Uh, it is clear that the actual New South Wales system of producing players, if Darren Coleman, uh, a, a widely regarded coach at shoot shield level who has won premierships with Moringa, Gordon, uh, taken teams to an NRC grand final, if he cannot produce results for the New South Wales Waratahs, then the system is broken, effectively. And it needs a complete and utter re-examination, not just uh, of the Waratahs themselves, but also the Waratahs and how it interacts with its its um, prospective comps with the Shoot Shield. They are, feel like two different entities entirely here in New South Wales. Um, and usually people go to one if the other one is pissing them off. Um, and that is a system that just cannot function optimally. It's broken, uh, you, and we and we need to completely re-examine and 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 recontextualize that. Now, that's not saying uh, destroy the shoot shield. I'm not saying that entirely because the shoot shield has worked for as long as it has for certain reasons. But such as what? <laughs> it's objection, true. objection, Nathan. He's talking about the uh, NRC in other terms. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm talking about the, the level below. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about talk. the level Here's below. Sorry, guys. So there you go, I'm going to talk. I'm talking about the level you're below. Thin it is very, thin ice. I'm, I'm saying that the actual development of players from the shoot shield through to the Waratahs uh, is still so disconnected and so discombobulated and so all over the place. Um, it's that it's so fractured. It's coming coming back. It kind of comes back to the whole point about centralization well, um, and the whole can discussion I, can around I centralization. Can I interject on that shoot shield talent pathway? 
the thing that I haven't figured out about Super Rugby is is it a development league or a proper club league? Because New Zealand, they're resting their players. You know, all the teams are sponsored by the same sponsor or used to be. All the teams' uh, kits are made by Adidas. Whereas Australia, it's a bit different. And then you have Shoot Shield, which they is SRU. Nathan, correct me if I'm wrong. And it's not actually kind of affiliated properly with New South Wales. Somewhat correct though, yeah. It basically, it basically runs it on its own entity, but um, like there's still some direct correlation with the World Tiles. Probably not as yeah. It's probably more. It's more sort of standing on its own than if you could sort of comparative club competitions like your John Aden Cups and, and your Hospital Cups in Queensland. Yeah, they're much more aligned. With the, with the Brumbies pathway and the Queensland pathway, respectively, yeah. even Fortescue Premier Grade is a bit more aligned. Is has some more alignment with, uh, you know, with the Western Forsyth program. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I'm kind of surprised that uh, the Brumbies just haven't partnered, just fully partnered with West Arbor, for example. I mean, yeah, like there's you've seen it in Mel- the Rebels have basically done that with Wests in Brisbane, like there's. Clubs have done this in the past, but I mean, mm. just the sort of re- one final thing we've sort of said, blown it up. Okay, cool. And it's one of those things, it, it goes on a sort of a bugbear of mine where we go, where people go on, on, since on social media a lot of the time and go, Oh, um, you, I know how we can fix Australian rugby, just invest in grassroots. And it's like, it's these broad statements of great, like, cool. Yeah, buzzword. we know buzzword crap. Buzz, yeah. yeah. So, okay, what do you actually do to blow it up? What changes? Eight, uh, men. I think I can I can answer that. I think the big the big difficulty for me um, is just that there is a lot of I mean I, I I cast my mind back to Matt Burke when he said if you haven't played for the Wallabies you can't talk about them. There is this distance. There is this literally elitism. You know, East Coast elite kind of with the Waratahs. The team hasn't performed for 10 years. It's a play thing. And you, I mean, if you go to the pubs in Surrey Hills near the stadium, it's all AFL now. Like, they should be owning that. On the walk from Central Station to the stadium in Sydney, there are two AFL murals. Like, the, and this is ostensibly Rugby Union Heartland. And they haven't done anything about it. And there is just a reeking sense of complacency. Today, the Waratahs posted about the 420 uh, try of the round after they got done by the force and there was one try. Like, why was that even conceived? It's just complacency after complacency after complacency. It's, it's sponsorship so, money. You have to you have you have a sponsorship but, agreement. I, I, but, and I, from a, cause I, I can answer this from a Wallabies world, perspective when you, you basically look for shit. When stuff, when again, you might have had zero tries or one tries. There are sponsorship agreements that would have told them you have to post. Yeah, so I get that, but, you, uh, but it's humiliating for the brand as well as for the the rugby team. And you've got to figure out out some ways about it. Maybe it's not about try of the round. Maybe it's about something else, like hard effort or something, or like play of the rounds a lot easier. Yeah. Maybe, Pivot. yeah. Um, so because sometimes you don't want to you don't want to post about something because you don't want to bring attention to it like that's pr 101 anyway i just kind of feel that i it's almost intractable and it's not blowing it up it's just an attitude change from top to bottom it is leadership it is entirely leadership it should be you know maybe it should be something as simple as no one in the senior executive team went could go can go to the same school as each other like literally, you gotta have some. Also, basic, but I actually think the, maybe that could be yeah. an easy solution. You know, I I was thinking, I was daydreaming. If I won that two hundred million dollar lotto, and I went to rugby Australia, got two hundred million dollars. This is what I want. Maybe that'd be one thing I would enforce. Like, I'm not really sure, but it needs a clean out. It, like, it needs a clean out. It could be the same people, but it's just how could you watch that mediocrity? How could you? be posting something as alien like alien as that um try of the round 
like think it through. What are you doing? Who are you appealing to? Um, they're just not thinking about it. It's just like, yeah, whatever. I mean, look at look at the the and this is rugby Australia, but look at the Lions tour. It's like pay a hundred bucks so you can be front in line to buy tickets, which you won't get a discount for that will cost you three hundred, four hundred dollars. It's just I mean, and you, that's, no that's sold out. it's sold out, but that's the thing. It goes straight to their fucking head. Supply, I, mean, that, I mean, firstly, that, that points to supply and demand, but I mean, yeah, I, I get that. It's a very valid point you're making of just changing that attitude, getting fans back involved, having that system sort of in place. Um, I guess to sort of round this up, because again, we've said yeah, this is going to be a short part. Um, yeah. I, I, I get that. I, I love the passion. Um, but Nick was really have final words. Um, how you, yeah, building off what Nick said, how do you turn this around? I completely agree with Nick Hartman on the on the, on the culture front. Um, the amount of conversations I've had with mates who are Waratahs fans after that Crusaders win, do you know what? How so many of them said to me, "This is our year," and that is not something that that is not an isolated incident. It happens frequently. Uh, there is a feeling of because we are Sydney and we are we are one of the strongest places you know for for rugby in Australia if not the strongest people probably think that well I'll tell you this you are the most underachieving side in the history of super rugby for a, for a, for a state that has so much uh great talent and potential what the hell have you done with it and there is a reason, I mean, seven-year-old Nick is so glad that he picked the Brumbies so often because the Brumbies actually turned up to my school and to and let me know that they were keen and they were looking for those fans. They, they said to me that that spoke to me more than any sort of prestigious brand in Sydney. Can I and say there's a reason. The school? Let Can me I... finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. And there is a reason why I always enjoy Tar Week because it's a reminder to take you bastards down a peg because you think that you're better than everyone else. So there has to be a complete culture change, and I think it can happen. I think it genuinely can happen. Um, starting from, and I'm not saying this as all of New South Wales rugby is broken. I'm not saying that at all. I've, you know, I play in club rugby and there is so many amazing things that I see happen every day. Uh, but to smash away, you, it's time to break away the assumption that uh, that when you South Wales, because you need to earn it. So um, I want to talk about the school visit stuff. Um, so I didn't go to a private school. Mm. I didn't grow up in the heartlands of the eastern suburbs, North Shore, Northern the... Beaches. Wait, how you here? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know, Nathan. I don't know. You imposter. Oh. Sorry, um, continue. And my kind of story was, I guess, my, my dad grew up in rugby league and he just kind of, you know, got a scratch and was looking for more and started following Union. That's why I'm here. And... Um, by the establishment at large, I never feel welcome. I never feel, hey, I like that. I, I, I never feel a good energy about it. It's the, the feeling I get is just like, oh, we're here. Like it, it, it it's just the, the culture and we expect it. There's a lot of expectation and not a lot of investment or passion. Um, and it's not just like a Waratahs thing. It's at large what Nick's talking about. It's a bit of a Sydney culture thing. So maybe the Tars are doomed to be disappointing forever. I mean, maybe that might be the, the, just how they are because it's just the underlying culture. But, yeah, um, uh, it's just even that. It's just... It's, it's just even like, hey, like, what do you care about in life? What do you want? And it's just not there for the Tars. Brumbies care about playing rugby and winning. Where are Tars? I don't know. If you lose, oh, whatever. I live in Vaucluse anyway. I can just go out my yacht tomorrow. 
but also there's there does, there's also something that comes with that, which is usually a lot of those people, if, if the Waratahs lose but Randwick win the comp, then everything is good in the world with rugby. As well, which yeah. is is also prevalent. I mean, a last final point that I will make because you know we we've, we've gone on much much longer than we said we would, but as that's how it is, is I still have a vivid memory. Nick and I once went to a shoot shield launch. Um. <laughs> Do you remember this, Nick? Yeah. Uh, I and remember when Checker was there. Checker, yeah, that's the one. Uh, right in the centre of town. And we got invited along as the Gagger, as the Green and God Rugby contingent. And I just remember looking at the Penrith Emu boys at the time and thinking, uh, you know, you'd, you'd heard all the stories and all the news about how the Shoot Shield had been saying to them, you have to meet up to our standards and our levels. Uh, otherwise, if you can't do that by round four or five, we're going to cut you from the comp. And that was shit. I'm not going to lie. That approach, that whole uh, att uh, approach, attention, uh, the treatment, I thought was uh, ridiculous. And if you were a state that genuinely wanted to further your, the rugby in your – if you genuinely wanted to further the rugby – and, of course, I'm, I know that – Penrith had issues all of its own and, and lots of problems in at the club, um, and it was active. But if you genuinely want to turn, the, it's mm. clear that there is such a disparity <laughs> between this yeah, club yeah, here yeah. and Sydney <laughs> University I mean, over here. And, and what I'm saying is, uh, bringing it back to the point is, if that's not an approach we should take no. with rugby. I mean, well, I was, was going to say that Penrith in, had their issues, but Parramatta, who are now Western Sydney and uh, uh, West Harbour don't exactly get a whole lot of love. No, they don't. They don't. And I mean, okay, like in in clubland up in Newcastle now, uh, we we have often talked about if a team if a if a, a team is struggling for numbers, we talk to them and give them players uh, so that everyone gets a game, or mm. we try and move a field. Like, and that's just small basic shit. Uh, mm. To say you've got to be be up to our level to play in a comp, that basically says you've got to meet our standards, and that doesn't exactly scream this is a game for everyone. Mm. And I think that is that it, it feeds into the whole bones of of the team and everything around it. And I mean, you alluded to the whole Waratah culture issue, and I mean, I haven't seen that personally. I cannot speak on that, but it needs change. So very, very strong words. And, you know, I think what you've sort of got out of this is, you know, even as Nick being a, a Dirty Brumbies fan, we are, as a podcast, we want the best of the Waratahs. We want to see the best from New, Zealand, New South Wales rugby, not just Sydney rugby, not just, you know, the little pocket. Mm. We want to see it all th thrive. And, you know, we hope, I, I, I was just spe speaking for everyone, but and mainly for myself, I'm, I'm hoping that this can end up being sort of the start of the new beginning for the Waratahs and they can turn it around and we can get a more a line system and we can go back to those days of 2014 when, you know, we're packing out ANZ Stadium, watching them win games. Um, but, yeah, as, as we've sort of as you've sort of seen, there's a lot of work to do and it start, starts with the head coach but definitely doesn't finish there. So um, just to wrap it up, thank you very much for listening to the episode. Um, if you like, comment, um, share it around, rate us. Yeah, even if you hate us, we we feast off the one star reviews, especially. So, cook, <laughs> cook us if you need. Yes, burn us. I'm waiting for a whole bunch of angry of angry sh uh, folks who who watch the shoot who watch the shoot shield and are obsessed with it, saying these boys hate us. They hate us. I all. think they're all dead, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, um, thank you. I would call that episode. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you the next time around. Fuck me now. <laughs> Fuck me, Hartman. <laughs> I, that was the perfect way to end. I love it. <laughs>